Good morning, everyone, and we'll get started. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'll call the Paulding County Board of Commissioners work session for March the 8th, 2022, to order at this time. And uh, Marshall already brought up the list that Jason just held up. And uh, as far as elected officials like uh, Sheriff Gary Gullich is here and any of the mayors here today, uh, we didn't elect you, did we, Terry? No. <laughs> All right, I don't guess I'm missing anybody then. I'm always afraid I will miss somebody, and I usually do. So we're delighted to have Miss Becky Shaley, who is the senior leader of uh, Firestar Ministries, and her heart that she's wearing has a fire on it. So, uh, Becky, thanks for being here and leading us in an invocation and then pledge to the flag. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, in the midst of all of the darkness and the violence that's in our world, we come to you today acknowledging, as did King David, that yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. O oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name this day. Thank you, Father, for the privilege to live in the great United States of America and for the freedoms we enjoy, especially to invoke your blessings on our public gatherings as we are today. We pray for all our government leaders, our military servicemen and women, our first responders, and all of their families for their protection, their health, their strength, Lord, their abundant grace and great wisdom to fulfill the duties as they serve, protect, and defend our country. And thank you, Father, that you sent your son Jesus into this world to carry the weight of the government on his shoulders so it does not have to rest on the shoulders of our commissioners here in Paulding County. We ask that you grant them clear vision this day and the days to come with great grace and wisdom that will empower them to accomplish all the needs to be done in Paulding County. Thank you, Father, in the wonderful and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Shaley. A beautiful prayer to start off our meeting. The uh, February 22nd, 2022 work session minutes and the February 22nd, 2022 board meeting minutes are available for review. Uh, in our Team Paulding segment this morning, it's another employee of the month. Uh, so it's Miss Brittany Kelly uh, from the probate court. And Jeff, if you want to run that now, it'd be great. Well, I nominated Brittany Kelly for Employee of the Month because um, she is always um, extraordinarily helpful. She is efficient. She's always on time. She's always happy and she's always willing to help out anybody in the office. Brittany's been with the county for three years um, so I've had a lot of time to get to know her and um, she's a joy and very pleasant to work with. So she does anything and everything administratively in the office and she's a perfect candidate for that because she can multitask, she can handle uh, multiple jobs at once without getting flustered or confused or forgetful. Um, so she handles everything now from our calendaring to our courtroom to audiovisual to supplies, uh, employee reviews, anything administrative. And she took a lot of that, uh, those duties off me and my chief clerk, Rhonda Bones. Um, I would say to Brittany, thank you very much for being a dedicated employee. Thank you for always being helpful, and thank you for always putting a smile on your face every day.
congratulations, Brittany. And that was Judge Altman there that uh, had all the kind words. <clears throat> if you didn't recognize him. Woodall, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we have no invited guests this morning. Uh, bid awards, item number two is to approve the construction contract for Mulberry Rock Park Phase 2 to the lowest responsible bidder, uh, Magnum Contracting LLC, at the amount of $1,675,330.16. This is a SPLOST funded purchase uh, that is located in Post 2. Ms. Pollard and Mr. Justice with Parks and Rec. Ms. Pollard with the finest, uh, is the finance director or here to talk about it? Good morning. Um, we received five, six bids. Five of those were within 10% of each other um, for this park project. And one of the goals of our SPLOS program was to get a park in every quadrant of the county. Um, this is phase two of Mulberry Rock and it will add um, it will extend the roadway through the remaining portion, the backside of the remaining portion of the park. It will um, include some storm culverts and road, roadway storm networks and sidewalks and trail and some site grading, water line installation, erosion and sediment control. Um, again, we received six bids. Five of those were within 10% of each other. And Croy um, assisted with these specs. That's... Um, says a lot for them because the specs were very clear and they are recommending award to the low bid uh, Magnum contracting in the amount of $1,675,330.16. Um, Michael Justice is available. We have, unless you have specific questions for him now, 13 and 14 also address this project. I'm always interested in the timetable. I'll let Michael talk about the timetable. We'll be ready to go um, as soon as, uh, good morning, by the way, I'm sorry. We'll be ready to go as soon as we get the paperwork um, ready through finance and we get a couple of signatures as far as the contractor starting. The main point, um, and we'll go into this in a little bit when we start talking about the Corps of Engineers and the nationwide permit and stuff like that, we have to be ready to go pretty quickly in, in a nutshell. Uh, so we'll begin the paperwork. Um, I wouldn't expect Magnum to take long to get out and get started on the project. Uh, just to give you a little background, they're the same group that just finished or are finishing the Taylor Farm project for us. And we've been very pleased with their, with their work to date. So it shouldn't take long. Um, we give them the standard, I think it's 180 days. Is that what we put in there? I don't remember. I believe so. Yeah, we'll give them that once they start to get the project completed. Most of this is infrastructure and, and road work um, and no structures involved, so to speak. So it should move fairly quickly. Any other questions? Thank well, you. I'll be running out to Sandy's Post to play, right? Uh, bit of word number three, um, it's also Ms. Paul and Mr. Justice, is to award the uh, purchase of a John Deere 41011 backhoe loader to Flint Equipment Company in the amount of $124,600. So tell us what that's going to be used for. Okay. The uh, landfill actually uh, operates as a transfer station. And so to this piece of equipment is, is used to pack the trash. So why is that important that we pack the trash? We have, um, I pulled the invoices for um, the hauling and you, they're comprised of two different items. One's a hauling fee and it's 327.24 for every load they take out of there. And the other one's a tipping fee. So that's the more we can get in there, um, the less hauling fees we have to pay. So we wanna make sure we can get as much trash on that, in that truck as we can. Um, the uh, fleet, this particular piece was purchased in 2005. We have two actually that operate. We have to have a backup to make sure that we have one operational. So we purchased one in 2005, we purchased another in 2015, and the 2005 has become a maintenance problem for fleet maintenance. And so they have requested that we replace that and move our 2015 to our backup. 
they requested that we purchase this off the state contract so it means the states actually bid the um, bid the equipment and Flint Equipment Company actually holds the bid um, for state contract and the amount of the 410 ale backhoe is $124,600 Any questions? Item number four is to approve the low bid provided by Bartow Paving in the amount of $80,200.87 for paving of the region's building parking lot located in post four. Ms. Pollard and Mr. Green to fill us in. Okay, the, um, 20, um, the region's building is currently owned by Paulding County Board of Commissioners and they lease a portion of it. That lease was renewed in uh, 2021. The fee for that lease ranges from, it increases every year, it's about 80,000, so it goes from 78,909.60 to 88,833.08 in this particular <coughs> lease. And in that lease agreement, we had agreed to a couple of maintenance items for the facility. One was a, um, ADA compliant ramp in the front and then the ceiling and marking and some parking lot repairs. This is the largest of those parking lot repairs. There'll be um, maybe a couple of small issues that we'll have to repair in that uh, area. But this one, uh, DOT actually accepted the bids for this one. So if you have any questions concerning the number of bids and that kind of thing, I'm sure they can either George or Scott can add to those requests. So did the backup reading have a schedule again, the timetable on that? I don't remember it. Um, they're expected to start very soon because the price of materials is fluctuating. So they would only guarantee this price for a short amount of time. Other questions? Thank you, Tabitha and Michael and Scott. <clears throat> so uh, we have no requests from or no reports excuse me, uh, from committees or departments this morning. Um, and no one who signed up for uh, agenda items. The consent agenda, <coughs> indulge me while I require to read these for the archives and the record of the meeting. Uh, item number five is to approve the request by the Pauling County Sheriff's Office to retire surplus Major Sheila Creighton's service weapon Glock Model 21 Serial number TYN992 at the cost of $469. Item number six is to authorize the chairman to enter into an agreement, an, an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Hiram for asphalt resurfacing on certain municipal roads which are connected to streets being resurfaced on upcoming county re resurfaced projects. The city shall uh, reimburse the county for the actual cost incurred for the work set forth, which is estimated at $230,000. Item number seven is to approve the proposed community development 2022 planning and zoning uh, division fee schedule. Number eight is to approve the acceptance of the streets listed below for perpetual maintenance by the county. It's Montgomery Lane and Montgomery View Court uh, in the Georgian post two. And item number nine is to approve supplemental funding of the Holt Consulting Company Work Authorization number 22 titled Sanitary Sewer Line Improvements and Existing Sanitary Sewer Line Test uh, the Design Phase Services Supplement at the Paulding Northwest Atlanta Airport in the amount of $32,670. So these items uh, are on the consent agenda and I'd ask if any of the commissioners would like to move them to, uh, to new business, to regular business. Hearing none, uh, they'll stay on the consent agenda item for this afternoon's vote. Um, so moving right into old business, uh, item number 10 is discuss action to adopt ordinance 
the Zoning Ordinance Text Amendment to adopt a Unified Development Ordinance for Pauling County, Georgia, UDO, the Pauling County Planning Commission and Board of Commissioners uh, to consider a text amendment to the Pauling County Zoning Ordinance uh, 2003 as amended. The amendment is in regards to the adoption of the Unified Development Ordinance tabled at the February 22nd, 2022 Board of Commissioners meeting. Ms. Lippman and County Attorney Mr. Jason Phillips are going to talk to us about it. <laughs> Thank you all and good morning. Um, this was, as you recall, two weeks ago on, I have to do it, February 22nd, 2022, two weeks ago, um, recommended unanimously by the Planning Commission for adoption. Um, in the past two weeks, I mean, we, we did encourage the tabling of this so we could get a little more public comment. We have made some tweaks to the ordinance that was approved by the Planning Commission um, regarding buffers in some of the um, low density residential districts, especially R1 and R2. We refined, we have a section that's new in the Planning Commission section. It's a reversion clause. Um, and so we made some tweaks to that. That in a nutshell is if you get a rezoning after today and you do not make substantial completion on that within a three year time period and do not receive an extension, um, that will revert back to the initial zoning. So we made some tweaks to that. Um, and at this time, as you all know, we are going through an update um, in partnership with DOT. Community development is updating our comprehensive plan and comprehensive transportation plan. One of the main goals in this UDO update was to tie every zoning district to an area on the future land use map. Um, and we had kind of an innovative new zoning district that we created called Plan Village. Um, and we allowed that district within a radius of the intersection of 278 and 92 and that was a two mile radius and a one mile radius of the Cedar Crest 92 381 intersection. Because we are updating our, our plans, one of the things in our update is to do five study areas um, that would be parcel specific study areas that would become nodes that would be in our new future development map in our update. Um, Based on that, we would recommend reserving and pulling out the Plan Village District at the current time in order for us to complete that study. Transportation and land use would be a big factor in where you would have a Plan Village. And a Plan Village, we want that to have a built-in market. We want to allow a variety of housing types, single family, townhouse, even apartments, but with built-in walkable retail that that density might serve as a built-in market. But at this time, we think we'd like to finish the comprehensive plan study and come back and insert this zoning district um, once we finish that, which will, that will be adopted no later than October 31st. Um, and we would love to have as many people, we'd love to have as many nodes. Maybe those aren't the only two nodes where a development like this would be beneficial. So we're gonna have five study areas that we're gonna be studying in depth. So we would like to hold off on that for now. But um, this has been a three year, almost three year project that we'd like to get adopted so we can move forward. That's the consent agenda item. We had needed to add some new zoning districts to the um, fee schedule. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. No questions? <laughs> Ian, great report, and just um, can't tell you how excited I am about it. Well, I do, I do. I mean, only because I see what some people say. I hear what they say, and I see what they say. People send me stuff as far as, you know, like, say, mobile home parks. I mean, just, so our mobile home park zoning, when people see it, just say they think that we're attracting mobile homes, but that thing's been in our zoning for yes. years, <laughs> and, and then people just want to point it out. But just explain how maybe Jason will hit on, you know, you got to offer certain things, or I mean, you set yourself up to be sued. Um, you know, I don't think somebody's touched that zoning for in 17 years. Um, or something actually, like, that. like in uh, so. draw everybody's attention to one of the screens or this map here. Um, this is a copy of the new zoning map showing all the new zoning districts. Mobile Home Park, um, it is, we had several districts that we simply renamed. Um, mobile Home Park was R6, and it was called Mobile Home Park. Um, last August, we eliminated R4 and R7, 
and quite frankly, the numbers no longer made sense to have an R1 and an R2 and then skip to R5 and R6. So we decided to rename Mobile Home Park, Mobile Home Park. Um, that is a carryover zoning district that's been in the Paulding County Zoning Ordinance since 1986. And um, ironically, we do have some mobile home parks, but they are all zoned R2. I believe the mobile home park, and I think Chris Robinson is back here somewhere. If, if you want a little more history on that, he can provide that better than me. But it, it's simply, it's a name change. Right. Yeah, and, I just, yeah. I mean, I just wanted you to hear. I mean, I see that. I saw that more than anything of questions of stuff. And, and, and as a reminder, with any, especially any of the new zoning districts, um, if you look at this map, I always joke when we get people who call and ask about my property zoned. Um, if you guess R2, you have a 75% chance of being right. So anything that's rezoned from R2 to something else will go through a public process. Well, adjacent property owners will be notified. They'll have a meeting before the planning commission. They'll have a meeting before the board of commissioners, and they can give input to county staff, and they can give input at that public meeting. Um, I don't think we kept to the and jason you might want to chime in on why we kept mobile home park um i don't see any change since 1987 we don't actually have any properties on mobile home park um and i really don't see it going forward but right i just like i said that's one of the things i mean among others i mean you know i could go on and on but <laughs> but i will say that you know it's something that's been you know have been working on for a long time and and you know um not just concentrating on residential and you know the stuff we've seen in the past with the smaller lots uh, all this you know the smallest lot for the most part is double in size of what it was when prd was brought in um so i applaud for all the work you have done but just even on the commercial and industrial and the buffers and i mean it, it's really moved this county i feel like where we've been kind of behind maybe lagging look into the future and see what the future use is and all that and tying it all together so thank you i think and you've adequately addressed the question <laughs> and I, i'd be remiss with it if i went without saying uh attorney fred bentley is here with us in the back of the room today and, and fred uh his firm and his staff has been have been instrumental in helping put this udo together Fred's here for another great topic, but we'll defer that to later. And one of the neat things about this UDO that has been a long time in the making is how organized it is and how easy to use. Do you want to comment on? Sure. Uh, we, we, everything's, um, that's why it was important to get a copy of uh, the, the zoning map because everything is color coded. There are tables that if someone wants to look at what the setbacks are in all the residential zoning district, there's a very simple table that you can look at. Um, I'll point out, I've pointed this out before the planning commission. We have a new type of use. It's called a special exception. Um, it's something that is not permitted outright, but it is permitted provided you meet a set of criteria and that criteria will be evaluated by the planning and zoning staff. Um, and in every zoning district, there's a, there's, this book has a lot of hyperlinks. So if you see that your use, like let's take for instance, a car wash in B2 is a special exception because there's some sewer requirements that are necessary. There's a hyperlink in that section that you click on and it takes you to that section where you can see what your requirements are. And so that's, I didn't really get to talk too much about our fees because it's on the consent agenda, so I'll take this as an opportunity. At the present time, we are actually not recommending a charge for special exceptions. We'll evaluate that um, as we move forward with, to see how many special exceptions that we have. But I also do want to point out we created two new residential zoning districts, um, a state residential that requires a two and a half make, acre minimum lot size in R1, which requires a one acre minimum lot size. Um, the minimum fee for this is $450. There, there's no charge based on the size of property with the other residential and non-residential zoning districts. So that's hopefully an incentive um, for people to have, especially in the western part of the county where they may want to have larger lots, but the incentive is that it's a very reasonable rezoning fee. And another thing I think is important is it wasn't just the uh, community development team that did this. 
uh, look around the room here and, and see the fire uh, department and the head representatives here. All the departments were represented. And again, uh, like Jason said, we had uh, Fred Bentley here to uh, guide us and steer us with his uh, great experience in other counties and municipalities. So it, um, economic development helped us out. Um, the school district was invited to participate in some of our conversations. Um, City of Hiram, since we are their planning and zoning department, they participated, DOT, the water system. This has been a, a group effort and we will hope to get this first part done. I will um, make a point that there is no Title III as of right now. We are still using our existing development regulations and standard details. And in the next few months, we will be coming back to you um, to insert Title III, which is, um, I, I like to joke that this book, when it's complete, is the who, what, when, where, how, why, and I've added wow, because hopefully we're going to get a lot of great new developments because of this, because the who is the Board of Commis Commissioners, the, the what is the how do you develop the property in Paulding County, um, I think the why is the one I have the hardest time answering. Um, how is the development regulations? Where is the zoning ordinance? And like I said, I've added wow because I hope that coming soon with especially some of the new, we have a lot of what I call bridges between your commercial and your industrial zoning district that are very specific to manufacturing and transportation uses that don't include some of the more heavy uses that a, a, a traditional light industrial, heavy industrial uses, so. I think I'll just end with wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, great report and just a great job. I think, you know, it's taken a while, but anything worth doing is worth doing right. right? Yes. We've had a couple of stops and let's get started again, and uh, those were good judgment calls. Thank you, Scott. And everybody else in the room had a part in it. It's, it's going to really add to the county. Thank you, ma'am. All right, thank you. Okay, moving on to new business, uh, begin with item number 11, which is the public hearing to receive public comments on resolution 22-05, uh, requesting amendments to the Pauling County form of government. So uh, at this time, I will open the public hearing, but before uh, those that wish to uh, speak come up, uh, I'd like to uh, get our county attorney, Jason Phillips, involved, uh, who uh, wrote the resolution and is... Uh, really screened and scrubbed this thing for us. So, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and before the, we begin to receive the public comment for today, I just wanted to take a few minutes and kind of rehash what the, uh, in the big picture, what Resolution 2205 does. Uh, it's been, it first appeared about a month ago. It was approved by y'all on February 8th. Uh, and it has since been submitted to the local legislative delegation for their consideration. Because this resolution is a request to change the form of county government, this type of change, uh, in particular the change where we're moving the executive power, has to go through the local uh, delegation for approval by the General Assembly. But just to rehash, in Paulding County, the governing authority consists of four post commissioners who are elected by district and one chairman who is elected countywide. They alone determine the legislative direction of the county. They're the county level legislature. Uh, it is their duty and obligation to pass ordinances, which are county laws, to set policy for the county, to set its budget, uh, to set its millage rate, for taxation purposes. Those are kind of the overarching duties. There are other duties, but those are the highlights. The chairman is 20% of this legislative body. He has, when, when the board is fully staffed, he has one vote amongst the five. In addition to having his legislative hat, he is also tasked with being the chief executive officer of the county. None of the other commissioners have executive authority. It solely rests with the chairman. As the chief executive officer, the chairman is responsible for carrying out and enforcing the ordinances and the resolutions passed by the Board of Commissioners, as well as many of the daily tasks that happen uh, with the county government. The primary effect of Resolution 2205 is to transfer the chief executive officer role, 
which currently rests in the office of the chairman to, a, to the county manager. So the county manager would become the chief executive officer. The county manager, as you're well aware, and under this resolution, is appointed by a majority vote of the five commissioners. The concept of placing executive, executive duties in a full-time county manager is designed to orchestrate and empower a professional CEO either on experience or education or a combination of both to run the county business on a full-time basis every day, much similar to a large corporation. Counties that have a, point, that have a CEO appointed county manager or county administrator, and as I mentioned uh, last month, don't get those terms confused. The question for this board and for the delegation is where is the executive power going to rest either in what you call a county manager or a county administrator. But other jurisdictions which have vested executive authority in the county manager or county, admi county administrator are Cherokee County, Forsyth County, Fayette County, Coweta County, Floyd County, Hall County, and Cobb County. That's an example of several. That's not the exhaustive list, but I just wanted to let the public know that this is a model that has been implemented in other jurisdictions uh, and worked successfully, better in some than in others, but based on our review, that is the, the board's recommendation here. But today is an opportunity for additional public input. And in regard to that input, the Board of Commissioners received several emails from members of the Paulding County community. And I want to repeat, or I want to recite, basically the, the, the essence of one of those emails uh, on this executive authority issue. The emails say, and, and, and many emails were received, they were all very similar, but this was the essence of, of the primary concern as I saw it. Resolution 2205, quote, gives a staggering level of control to an unelected bureaucrat who would be accountable only to the board members, not the public. That sets up for avoiding responsibility by duly elected officials. And the email kind of categorized that concern in the following statement that the commissioners could say, the county manager decided that, not us. That was the concern expressed in these emails. I would agree with the email in that it places considerable executive authority into an appointed official, that county manager. However, under 2205, responsibility and accountability remain squarely within the duly elected Board of Commissioners. They have the authority to hire the most qualified candidate for the job. In addition to the authority to hire, they have the authority to terminate the county manager at any time, 365 days a year. The county, the county manager position would be what we term in the legal world as an at-will employee. An at-will employee is not protected by the county's civil service system. The majority of county employees are civil service employees, which means they can only be terminated for cause. The department heads and various others, including this county manager, would be an at-will employee. Under the Georgia case law, an at-will employee is defined, the relationship is defined as follows. The employer, which in this case would be the Board of Commissioners, the employer with or without cause, and regardless of motives, may discharge the county manager without liability. That is the nature of an at-will employee. So for example, if your county manager, as the CEO, asserts too much control over department operations, fails to include agenda items on this agenda that had been requested by the various commissioners, engages in frivolous or irresponsible spending, terminates employees contrary to the wishes of a majority of the Board of Commissioners, 
recommends a financially irresponsible budget or just generally engages in conduct that is unbecoming of how an executive is expected to operate the county, in that case, the Board of Commissioners could terminate that county manager at any time and hire a new county manager who understands the expectations of the elected Board of Commissioners. When a CEO county manager makes a decision, their decision making is going to be driven by what do these five elected officials want? Or in reality, what do at least three of them want? Because three comprises a majority. On the flip side, if the chief executive officer remains in the chairman's position, and I'm not suggesting that this has occurred, but in the event it does, if the chairman abuses or mismanages executive power, there is no changing out the chair. Voters will have a single opportunity once every four years to change out the chairperson and elect a new chairperson who hopefully will not abuse such executive power. There is another option uh, when a chairman or any post commissioner is in office. There is a vehicle called a recall petition uh, where the voters can recall a sitting elected official. The challenge with that, however, is that you have to acquire signatures of 35% of the registered voters within a 45-day period, and the math on that is 43,750 signatures. So as you can see, that's, that's uh, quite a high task. So the bottom line in 2205, and there are other provisions in it, but these are the highlight, this is the highlight. The bottom line of resolution 2205, it gives the full board of commissioners full control over the manner in which executive power is exercised through its complete control over who it selects as the county manager and if necessary, when, they, when and if they terminate that county manager if they've abused that executive authority. So with that opening remark, Mr. Chairman, I would defer to you. I know we have the list, and it might be easier to just call the names on the list, and when you get to the last name, ask if there are any others who have not signed up who wish to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Phillips, and that's exactly what I'll do. There's no requirement uh, for any order. Uh, but uh, the first person on the list is Mr. Wayne McCauley. And uh, so, Mr. McCauley, if you want to come forward at this time and share with us, we appreciate your being here. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. If I understand this right, part of your job is being transferred to someone else, correct? You just address your thoughts to me, and okay. later on we'll uh, see if any is. I do know that we have an elected board here that is to run this county. Being born and raised in this county, we've never had a county manager, and the county's run fine. Why all of a sudden do we need a county manager that's going to get taxpayer money that these boys standing right back here in the corner could use to make us a lot safer than what we are in this county. You're losing part of your responsibility to run the county, drawing all your pay and we're paying extra man. And I, as a resident of this county and a taxpayer of this county, I don't feel that's right. That's why we have the elections, to elect the people to run this county. So why, I mean, we've never had the county manager. Why do we need it now? It's worked fine for, I'm 70 years old now, so it's worked fine for that 70 years without having the county manager. And that money that that county manager could make or would make or will make, whatever the amount, I don't know what the amount is, could go to our fire department and our county sheriff's department to get equipment they need to keep us safe from crime and fires and leave it just like it is because it's been working good all these years. Why change it? 
That's all I want to know is why change it. Why, if it's not broke, don't fix it. It's what I'm saying. And Brian ought to understand that with all the equipment he runs. If it ain't broke, you don't tear it down and work on it, do you, Brian? <laughs> but that, that's all I've got to say. That's my question. Why do we need them? The county's worked fine all these years. I say, turn this down. Don't do it. Give that money that would pay that salary to these people back here. Those are the people that we need that need money. Not some just a low 2.8% raise every three or four years. They need tons of money to keep this county safe from crime and fire. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tully? <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the commission. Mr. Baker, Mr. Phillips. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I assume that the emails you spoke about are probably some of these I have here. I have 73. I would gladly pass into your hands. Uh, thank you for the comprehensive explanation of 2205. Um, I'm glad it's taking place. I wished it had taken place 30 days ago. Um, I'm here today to ask, are we utilizing our current structure to its ability? We have an administrator. Is he being used to his fullest potential in that position? Not Mr. Baker, that position. Does it actually require the elevation to a county manager or CEO? There was mention of some counties that are using that system, and there are some people in this room that fled those counties because of that system. Um, we are Paulding County. There is no doubt that our growth is extensive, and the future view is large. The who in this room is the citizen. We are the ones that inevitably feel your decisions and require to be included in those decisions to some extent. There are things, I talked about those last month, there are things that the Board of Commissioners do that are part of your day-to-day -day commission duties. Changes to the form of county government are larger than that. They will, in effect, effect every, every life in this county. As a citizen, um, it is my goal and desire to make sure that the monies that we have in this county, are we are fiscally responsible to those things, that services in this county are well-funded, the citizens are representative, represented by our commission. Um, I am only interested in accountability, transparency, and the inclusion of our citizens. And with that, I'll leave it to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> uh, Miss Virginia Galloway, we thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for giving uh, this opportunity for citizens to speak. Uh, that was really important to me when I spoke last time. Uh, I will say that my opinion has not really changed, but my main purpose here is to say thank you to each one of you for giving all of us a chance to be respected uh, and allowed to voice an opinion on something uh, that affects our county and affects our lives uh, in the coming years and even decades, possibly. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Virginia. In batting cleanup is Miss Deborah Sieber. That means you're fourth.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, so much. I just have two quick questions, and I guess this is not a question and answer time, but um, with regards to this new position, um, I would imagine there is going to be a list of qualifications, and are the public going to be able to see those that list of qualifications, or is it just something that you guys are going to create as to this position, what type of qualifications this individual needs? Um, secondly is, does this individual, are they going to be required to be a uh, Paulding County resident? Um, because I see everyone sitting back here, and although you all know me, I was not born here in Paulding County, um, but they have such a passion, and that's one of the things I like so much about all, you know, most of y'all, especially Brian, you know, when you have a, when you've been born and raised in this county, there's a passion for this county, and just wondering if that position would, re uh, would require that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Beverly Cochran, thank you for being here, Beverly. Good morning. Good morning. I was present at the February 8th meeting and submitted an email to Sandy ahead of time with my feelings, even though I didn't speak, the people that did speak spoke on behalf of asking either to delay the vote or to hold a public hearing. And so I failed to let my voice be heard. So today I'm here rather than uh, letting someone steal my voice to share it with you that I haven't changed my opinion uh, on this. I'm still opposed, but I appreciate very much the opportunity that you have opened up to allow the citizens to speak. I wrote down some things, but after being here, uh, a couple of things that I thought about is that, you know, it takes all of us out here and our property tax and our sales tax to fund the operations of the county. So it is very important that you get to hear what it is that we think. And with my experience of working with the county, I think that the county administrator form, it's not a form of government, but it's a division of the government, works very well. And that I don't understand at this point in time with Chairman Carmichael's second uh, term in office, why at this point in time that it's become so urgent for us to do this. And I do know that if you do change it to a county manager form of government, because of the transfer of the powers that generally the chairman's salary is cut, that was never addressed. But I do know that in quite a few of the counties that has that form of government, that your chairman becomes part-time. So that's something I just wanted to throw out to you this morning. And I would respectfully ask that you reverse your vote and hold off on this until at least a time just before the next election to allow Chairman Carmichael to fulfill his duties as chairman and CEO of the county or to just uh, reverse them, period. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. And Ms. Kathy Helms, thank you for being here, Kathy. Good morning. Good morning. I'm nursing my annual allergies, so bear with me. Um, I'm, I'm really not clear why this resolution was even created. Everything that you're asking to be done can already be done with the form of government we have with the county administrator. As the chairman, you can assign him to do many of those things that you're wanting to change 
our whole form of government to do. No, it can stay exactly the same. You don't have to change a thing, and you can still transfer those powers. And I'm also not clear why this has been so rushed. And I, I want to say there may be some question regarding the validity of the vote to approve this resolution. That should be resolved first before anything else happens. And how about we take a cue from our sheriff when he wanted a new jail? I heard him stand up here for years saying, we need a new jail, we need a new jail. Finally, he asked you to put it on the ballot. It passed overwhelmingly by the citizens. Why don't we put this on the ballot in November and see what the community wants? Doing so will remove any dissension surrounding this change to our government. I will be asking the legislative delegation to do the same thing. Involving citizens in this process results in a positive outcome for everyone. Citizen participation is an essential part of open governance. And to quote Patrick Henry, the liberties of a people never were, never ever will be secure when the transactions of their rulers may be concealed from them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Helms. Are there any other, hold on just a second. Are there any other citizens uh, that would like to participate in this public hearing? Do you have a sheet up there, Rebecca? I do. Okay. Do you, can you sign in, please? You do, you do. I'll do all that later. I'll just probably can get done this time. I'm here for the same purpose that everyone else has been here. Um, I, I spoke at the. Refresh those who may not know. Okay, I am Carol McLeod. And I live in Paulding County, and I moved here in the 90s, early 90s, when everything was exploding. Um, I understand the manager position very well. I've researched it. Um, I know there was a couple of um, comments made that, you know, that we've never had a manager system, but I think we did back in the early 90s. I'm pretty sure we did. And then there was a, um, a meeting held on April the 11th, 2017, when the last board asked for um, a motion to adopt the job description for county operations manager and approve uh, the human resources to begin the hiring process. So it was brought up before as a manager position. And at the time, it seemed like that was the way to go then as well as it is now. I am for it. I praise you for coming up. I know that was a hard decision to have to come to, but with the growth and with what's going on in our county uh, and being one of the fastest growing um, counties in the state of Georgia, I think it is needed. I think any operation as large as this one uh, years ago, maybe it didn't need to be a manager position, but now I think we do. I think it's a very good idea that the person that's making the personnel decisions and helping to make those decisions is held um, working with you with those decisions, and it's in my understanding that you still will have the final say-so, and I think that's one of the big um, concerns. I've heard some of the uh, people speak about that and talk to me about it. But after I explained it better to them, they had a better understanding. So I think there's a good many people in the county that aren't here today that are very, very much um, uh, like the idea as well. I thank you for what you do every day. I know it's hard. And you never know what the job is until you walk in a man or woman's job and you're part of that skin that's underneath there. So I know that there are things that we don't know because you can't discuss those with us. That's part of your jobs until the decisions are made. And I just appreciate what you do. It's a hard job. And I thank you and thank you uh, for letting me speak again. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. McLeod, very much. Any other citizens that would like to come forward and speak?
just sign up, please, and we know who you are, but tell Good us morning. again. I wasn't going to speak, but I um, just want to clarify something, too. Back in the 90s, uh, when Commissioner uh, Carruth did, when he turned his power over, he turned it over to his administrator. When Commissioner Charon, Charon got in there, then he took his power back. So we can, you can do what you're talking about doing now. That's one of the main things that's, that's going on. If that's not true, I know Jason and the, the farm's been here forever and they can kind of verify that. But I know that, that that can be done and can be changed back and forth where you're at right now. Another thing to me, uh, just sitting here listening, when you put it in the hands of a bureaucrat, basically what we're doing, we're, taking, we're putting another level between the, the citizens and their government. The citizens already feel disenfranchised with most governments out there anyway. I'm not just talking about Paulding County, but all governments. And so to put another layer between the citizens and their government, I just feel like you're going to cause even more disenfranchisement with most citizens out here. That's all I wanted to say. And thank you guys again for doing this. Uh, one other thing I was going to say, just one of the questions that was asked by several of the legislators to us was, since the chairman basically is going to be kind of a part-time job too, will his salary be reduced? That is something that they really want to know. So I think that's something y'all need to address to let them know what's going on too, because they do think, they do see now that when you're taking the CEO, the chairman's being paid to be the CEO, and when the CEO is being turned over to a manager, will the chairman's salary be reduced? Because if not, you're paying too high salaries for doing basically the same job. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> Just sign in, please, and yes. tell us who you are. We know, but tell us anyway. <laughs> Good morning, all. My name is Lydia Rollins, and I am here to speak in favor of what you are proposing. Um, I'm going to present an analogy, if you call, want to call it that. Um, I worked for a huge corporation, I won't say who, but I was their operations manager. We, it was a wholesale building products distributor. We had over $50 million in sales yearly. And I was, as I said, the operations manager in charge of 40,000 line items that, of materials that we carried in the warehouse. I obviously alone could not do all of that going out there checking everything. I had people underneath me that I signed to the various um, products so that they could on a daily, weekly basis tell me where we were so we could make sure that we had enough product in the warehouse to sell. Um, this analogy I'm using is because you yourself, Mr. Chairman, have a lot on your plate. So you obviously, you know, if you want to help our co county grow, continue to grow in a proper manner, you need people underneath you that you can entrust to do the everyday tasks so you can do the bigger tasks. And this is what I am interpreting you folks are proposing now, and I wholly support it. We need you, the head of Pauling County, out there bringing in the big businesses, bringing, making sure that our county grows in a proper manner. And therefore, in order to do that, to free up your time to do that, you need someone that the board as a whole can entrust the daily, I don't wanna say mundane, but the daily tasks that will free you up to do what we elected you to do and the whole board. And that's what I have to say, thank you. Appreciate everything everyone is doing. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Rollins. <clears throat> Any other comments? Citizens wishing to speak? Going, going, gone. So, at uh, first of all, before I close out the public hearing, thank you so much for being willing to come up and, and uh, speak your thoughts in your mind. Um, <clears throat> served in the military for quite a long time, and uh, that's one of the reasons that 
We did it, wasn't it, Wayne? Where's Wayne? Is he still here? Yeah. Um, so it's very important to me and to uh, the commissioners um, that we hear from you. To me, that's the, the most gratifying part of the job is to hear from you. Uh, we, we would have had a public hearing before if it, if it were required. And requirement means by enabling legislation. But uh, I can see some people that I heard from that, you know, use require as, well, it's a good thing because you need to hear from the people. As soon as, as, soon as that got in my brain housing group, it was like, yeah, we're, we're going to do that. So, again, I thank you for being, being here and being will, willing to speak. But uh, at this time, I'm going to close the public hearing, but uh, ask if there are people here on the panel that would like to address anything that was said or clarify anything that was said. Mr. Chairman, if I just address three legal issues that were raised by the various speakers. Um, one, historically in Baldwin County, um, Chairman Carruth, I believe in 1999, created the position, I don't want to bore you with too many legal details, but under state law, a county can create a county manager. In 1999, Paulding County by resolution created the position of county manager. In the same resolution, it was decided that we would not call that person a county manager. We would call that person a county administrator. To date, that position currently occupied by Mr. Baker has remained titled county administrator. However, the interesting thing is that while the statute creates that, in Paulding County, you cannot simply shift the executive authority, which is vested in the chairman, over to the county administrator or county manager by a county ordinance or by a county resolution. Uh, a couple of speakers um, alluded to it might be possible. Um, just wanted you all to know that we looked at that authority and under the Georgia Supreme Court case of Gray versus Dixon from 1982, they determined that any attempt by that to transfer executive authority vested in the chairman to a county manager would be unconstitutional. That would take an act of the General Assembly. And that is why 2205 seeks the change from the General Assembly. Uh, another legal point I wanted to address, uh, the question was raised about uh, could the county require the county manager to be a resident of Paulding County? Um, there is a state statute that prohibits a county from requiring any of its employees from residing in the county. The same hold, holds true for municipalities. So just know state law would prohibit that regardless of the policy behind whether that's a good or a bad idea. It's just prohibited. Thank you. Any of the commissioners have uh, comments that were stimulated or, or came up as our speakers were sharing their ideas? Well, let me obviously, we did listen and we postponed the, and had a, uh, can you hear me now? Better? Okay. So having this public meeting, I hope does help. Uh, dilute some of the feelings and stuff like that and we have done a lot of thinking and processing this and looked at it as through as a businessman's eyes is the only way I know how to look at it and a lot of most businesses by far this size runs this way um, by far business wouldn't do it if it didn't run well uh, school board three times the size of us runs this way along with actually more uh, like a strong manager or position like a strong city manager position where it can't really changes the way that the employees interacts with the commissioners or the city councilmen and stuff like that so we've looked at it and, and it is and, and and really I think of it as being I think Miss Ham said something on, and it made me think about being transparent well this is really is if we could transfer this power without anybody saying then 
we would just right do it like they said Bill Cruz did, right? But if we're putting it out there and changing the way of orders, being transparent on how we want to operate, besides just delegating the power without any of y'all's input. So it just it just popped up in my head when she was speaking about why we just don't transfer power and it was just it's really about being transparent and putting it out there for the citizens to know how we operate or won't operate. Thank you, Brian. I, I was taking notes. Uh, with Mr. McCauley, uh, responsibilities uh, was one of his concerns uh, transferred to someone else. Um, uh, well, a couple of things. The, the county administrator had, did, had nothing to do with this, absolutely nothing to do with this. It was five commissioners that were interested in evaluating and comparing to other counties. As Ms. McLeod said, uh, on February 8th, 71 counties in Georgia out of 159 have a county manager. Um, so, yeah, no, the, uh, Frank and I were talking this morning, it's like it, it, everything's going to be about the same other than a couple of things I'll mention in just a moment. Um, there's no additional taxpayer money. There's, there's no uh, salary increase for uh, the county manager uh, who will be Mr. Baker. Um, it's his same salary. <clears throat> Nod your head up and down, Tara. <laughs> All right. Um, th there was kind of a question of what, are we using the current position um, effectively, I guess. Um, I'll touch on that here in just a second. Um, Ms. Galloway just talked about the, uh, the main purpose. Uh, what this board does uh, is try to find ways to be more effective and efficient in, in how we operate. And there's some of the previous board members in the room uh, that uh, helped bring Scott Green to the position of Director of Operations. Uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, advantage for the county uh, in doing that. <clears throat> um, qualifications. Well, wow. you know, you can have people run for elections that have very unusual qualifications. I, I don't know that flying a military airplane or an Eastern Airlines airplane or managing the state's flight operation had a whole lot to do with uh, all the engineering and um, all the challenges that go on around here. <clears throat> I reread last night uh, the resolution itself, and it was produced from, from facts, and some of them have already been mentioned. The uh, main reason that counties have uh, county managers is because they get larger. Um, in, at the census in the year 2000, the county had 81,678 people, and today we have just under 170,000 people. The, so it's, it's double the number of people. The uh, budget was $44 million, and today it's $191 million. So a lot of people have said, you know, why do you need to do it? It's been working great. Well, we're not the same county we were 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, we've quadrupled in budget. The uh, UC, uh, UCGA, the Uniform Code of Georgia Annotated, Title 36, Section 5, Paragraph 22, is what Jason alluded to, and is that it says the counties may create the Office of County Manager to carry out the functions, uh, or <coughs> let me get, get that in a second. So Paulding County in 1999, uh, under Commissioner Carruth, uh, Resolution 23, uh, through the, the statutory guidance, through the state's guidance, um, titled the county manager position, a county administrator, to carry out more of the functions that were of an administrative nature. Um, 
the <coughs> having the county manager as a CEO is is due to this. It's because of the intense daily uh, operating operational demands uh, that we we have need of someone who's tremendously experienced and educated uh, and. <coughs> You know, it's, it's impossible to come into the chairman's job and be immediately an effective uh, chief executive. It's impossible, and I don't think any of the citizens should want that. If, and the, uh, the county manager doesn't get elected, so that he or she can stay in that position with all of their experience and working with all of the departments and be effective immediately. They don't have to leave. So I think that's one of the biggest arguments in favor of having a county manager. Uh, most of our department heads in the room have, have worked 10, 15 years with the county. That experience is irreplaceable. Whereas <clears throat> if you hire just, just some fictional person that gets elected, <clears throat> uh, I think you've diminished your chances of real, really strong success as a county. So when I roll off, you're going to be able to put somebody right in this seat that's all ready to go. Maybe they're, they've been a doctor or maybe they've uh, had a landscaping business, you know. They wouldn't be nearly as capable as uh, Mr. Baker if he were to stay that long. So we're a big county now, we're a large county government, it's different, it needs to be run effectively and professionally. Uh, we as a board of five members on February the 8th in the afternoon session voted 5-0 to, um, to make this change. Um, it's a transmission, a transmission, a transition uh, from an administrative focus to a executive focus and <clears throat> it frees up the chairman in the future, whoever it is, it frees them up to work with Mayor Kelly, to work with Mayor um, Moran, to work with our state delegates. Uh, there was an event last night with the state delegates, uh, a bill that they're looking to change. Uh, this time of year when they're in session, it's extremely important to be in contact with them on a regular basis. The ACCG, Association of County Commissioners of Georgia, um, I've been the revenue finance uh, chairman for that committee. There are nine different committees uh, for about a year now. And I can have more effect in working with the, um, the policy makers at ACCG than most of the so-called executive jobs uh, in Pauling County. So, you know, being able to get out to the Northwest Georgia Regional Council and work with the whole region in the 15 counties of that region, you just don't have time to do it if you're doing the everyday. Uh, I've talked to Brian about running his business. He was freed up to be a much more successful businessman after he, after he decided, hey, I need to assign Joe or whoever it was and trust them to get the things done. And as some people have mentioned, uh, this is more like a, a business, run like a business. And I agree, uh, you, when you're willing to turn over to your department heads the authority and trust them for their expertise, it's a lot more effective county government. And it really surprises me that, that, that more people in this room don't realize that. We're, the only motivation we have is for the county to be better and to be more effective. Um, the Board of Education, <clears throat> they, the, Mr. Erickson sits right where Scott is right now. And he's here for every uh, planning commission meeting, and that's something that we as a board initiated. Get the school system in here when we're talking about applications for more homes or for whatever. So the relationship with the Board of Education is huge. The Chamber of Commerce, the relation with them is important. The Economic Development Organization, 
fortunately, we have two of the commissioners that are on that, and <clears throat> Brian's been the chair. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I talk to Michael Hughes, who's the executive director there, almost every day. How are other counties doing it? Um, you know, that's, I, need, I need to be on the phone with Steve Taylor in Bartow County and the other counties and say, how are you working on this problem that you have in your county? I need to be doing things like that. Uh, so the other thing, maybe most important of all, is the citizens. The people on this panel do and will continue to speak with any and all of you whenever you're available to speak. I don't, have you ever turned down anybody that's asked to speak to you? And the best idea for county government that may be sitting in this room, I would, I would be a terrible leader to, to not want to listen to the ideas that you have and, and the same with all of us. So let me just say in my comments, the best idea for Paulding County in any of the issues we deal with may be sitting right here in this room. That's, that's what I believe in my heart. It's not just something I'm trying to say to look good. Um, any comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> All right, so um, I did close out the public hearing, and then we started with uh, other comments, so I'm good, right? Yes, sir. Item 12. Item number 12 is to uh, the action to adopt Ordinance 22-02, an ordinance to make findings of fact based on evidence of adverse secondary effects of adult use and sexually oriented businesses in reports and cases made available to the county. Um, that's to provide for updated regulations of sexually oriented businesses for the light industrial and heavy industrial zoning districts within the county limits. To provide a new section to chapter 46, article seven, entitled obscenity and other offenses. Ms. Lippman is gonna address this uh, along with our special guest, Mr. Fred Bentley of Bentley & Bentley. I will keep my part short and sweet. Um, this is part of the changes to our Unified Development Ordinance. Um, this was previously under a category entitled Adult Entertainment Establishments, and we are recommending it be changed to Sexually Oriented Businesses. And with that, I will introduce Fred Bentley with the, law f the Bentley Law Firm and Marietta, who has been assisting us with this and is here to speak on this. And I believe Chief Hess with the Marshall Bureau also has some commentary. And how many other counties and municipalities have you worked with to get them through this? More than I care to remember. <laughs> you know, certainly y'all been debating the serious issues of the day. And let me just say this on behalf of the, the staff that I had the pleasure of working with over the last few years, even through COVID, through the use of technology, uh, I just, y'all have got it right here and y'all work extremely hard and let me just say to this audience every single one of these folks spent time in the room working on these ordinances and that is a, an amazing situation because that's not always the case I've been in an instance with a tree ordinance many many years ago where I was the whole council got up and left and went outside while I read for about two and a half hours because in that particular jurisdiction you had to read every word of every ordinance this morning i am especially thankful that i do not have to read to you about sexually oriented businesses so i am uh, certainly glad to be here there is there are certain protocols that you have to do in connection with that uh, the first amendment and whether i agree with the supreme court of the united states of how they have taken the First Amendment uh, and expanded the freedom of expression, it matters not. They have provided 
guidance through the years, and they allow you as a community to address time, place, and manner uh, for what you had before called adult entertainment. Uh, over time, these ordinances, your ordinance was passed in 1986, which was, we went through that in Cobb County, and my guess is uh, rip off and duplicate is probably the order of the day, and a lot of these folks, I'm not suggesting that their law firm did that, but that there were a rash of these that were put in place. All I can tell you is that the folks that uh, promulgate these types of things have become quite inventive through the court systems, and it is necessary for you to go through very, very specific findings of fact and conclusions of law to make sure that your ordinance deals exclusively with time, place, and manner in a limited manner so that you allow the expression of adult and you just fill in the blank or sexually oriented businesses and limit those things that are not protected. In addition, you have to write ordinances that are content neutral. And so each of you were provided with a series of studies and I brought them here. I know y'all got thumb drives, so I had to kill a tree and I will be tendering that to the clerk as part of the official administrative record. I know each of you were given those and I'm sure you, you are probably bleary eyed after reading those. I would certainly commend to you, you've looked at a number of the things in Sandy Springs. I will tell you there is a copy of the Sandy Springs meeting that occurred where we sent uh, three individual, four individuals undercover into the clubs in that part of the world and it will curl your toes in terms of the evidence that came forth in terms of the adverse secondary effects and you can as a part of your public duty control the adverse secondary effects. One of those ways is to remove alcohol from establishments. Uh, as, and, I've, and I've got Trevor Hess who will be here who's worked undercover and we'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, but I, in that material you've got all the what I'll call the case law that addresses this issue over time, dating back to the city of Renton versus Playtime Theaters, city of Los Angeles versus Almeida Books. You've got a long litany in terms of a purpose clause that we are commending to you that we ask that you adopt uh, and make that as a part of your finding. As a part of it as well, it includes an obscenity, what I'll call a mini obscenity ordinance, which the state of Georgia it was declared unconstitutional in a case called this, that, and the other, which is in Cobb County. The judge indicated, here's what you need to do to fix it, and the Georgia legislature determined that they were not going to fix it. So right now, we do not have an obscenity ordinance in the state legislature. And that was with them saying, we're just not going to touch that. So most of the jurisdictions around you have passed what I will call a mini obscenity ordinance that fixes the one problem as it relates to that, as it relates to that ordinance, and that is included in this material as well. So that is part of your ordinance. So with that, let me call up um, Mr. Hess, who is served with distinction as your marshal, your chief marshal, and have him come offer you some testimony uh, for you to consider as well. And then I'll be glad to answer any questions that I can. I, I, I don't know that I can shed much on the issue of sexually oriented businesses, but I will certainly attempt. Yes, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Fred. Uh, I, I, I do want to thank Fred, too. Uh, he did a great job with this. Miss Littman, um, she was part of helping all this, and her staff. Um, like Fred said, this has been a this has been a long time coming because this ordinance has not been updated since uh, '97, um, and I've heard today a lot of talk about growth in the county and uh, how the county has just skyrocketed from that, that particular time. And if we don't if we don't get a hold of this, we we could get bit. So I think that this is very important to discuss although some people don't want to discuss this all the time. <laughs> um, 
And, and like Fred said, when I was with our good sheriff, um, I was lucky enough to somehow be thrown into the mix of working some undercover and uh, dealing with some of these adverse secondary effects. Although we don't have them here because we don't have any of these establishments, we don't want to get those. Um, so essentially, as Fred alluded to, there's a lot of studies, a lot of case law that are able to show the secondary effects that, inc that are included with these particular establishments. Uh, they are to include but not limited to property crime, prostitution, drug use, sexual assaults, and exploitation, and urban blight. Uh, it even is to get pushed as far as having ob armed robbery of patrons that, that uh, frequent these establishments. Um, it also has shown that the majority of patrons that frequent these establishments are from outside of the county, which then brings crime in from outside of the county. So we have to protect ourselves from that. Uh, they've also shown that the best way to regulate these businesses while not restricting or denying their First Amendment uh, rights, as Fred has alluded to, is by zoning and alcohol re regulations. Okay. Uh, this new ordinance, if adopted, will provide the county with the ability to better regulate these businesses and mitigate those secondary effects that would harm the welfare and the safety of the public of our good citizens. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Fred. Thank you, Chief Hess. Are there any questions for the chief as it relates to his testimony? I know the answer to this, Fred, but uh, light industrial, uh, those locations, those zone locations, there must That's, be some background on that. Uh, many jurisdictions choose to go to those locations. Uh, they, quite frankly, don't want them in the downtown areas or areas where you have a lot of homes or a lot of other things. So that's, you know, it's kind of a choice of a venue and it seemed like it was probably the, the view that that was probably the better place. You do have to provide opportunities for the forum. Uh, it is extremely difficult in situations in counties such as this. Uh, the, the appellate courts have even given some renderings of like uh, one establishment per 9,000 citizens is the only case that I'm aware of that actually went to look at the number of people and saying, well, this is what we think is appropriate, which is questionable at best. I'm not sure how they arrive at that number, but they determined that that was constitutional. So uh, I think the answer is it was felt like that there would not be as much damage in terms of property damage and other things occurring in that particular location. And we had your staff, uh, Chris Robinson actually went and developed a map so you do have the adequate number of locations that could be filled out, which is an important part of making your ordinance constitutional as well. And of course, here's the problem. If you don't have an ordinance or it's declared unconstitutional, you open the door and they can just about open anywhere. As Mr. Phillips will attest. I would say that those litigate on behalf of adult entertainment establishments are uh, experts at what they do. And they are experts at reviewing local jurisdictions ordinances and finding loopholes to jump through. So that's why an exercise like this is important to make sure that the ordinances that we have in place best reflect the policies and opinions of the citizens and its board of commissioners while at the same time honoring those rights that are protected under the Constitution. Yeah, if, you, if you want to get an absolute clear picture, look at the testimony in the depositions that occurred in the Sandy Springs. That litigation went on for 10 years. So if you want to get an idea of how insistent they are, that's what, that's what you're looking at if you don't have something that's proper and in place. But there's the testimony of August 16, 2012, as a deposition that I attended that I was involved with. We went, took expert opinions because you'll recall Fulton County lost that case before. And they spent years 
trying to put something back in place to protect the citizens there. And that is the deposition testimony of Tamara Lynn Corazala. And she described herself as the madam of flashers. And I will leave everything that you want to read into that. Uh, it, is, it was evil, the different things that were occurring that she openly admitted to that were right on her noses. The drug abuse, the alcohol abuse, the prostitution, the other things that you want to protect your citizens from. Let's take this opportunity to thank you for getting us uh, lined up correctly here. We don't need any lawsuits out here. I want to say thank you, Mr. Bentley, for helping us with this project. It was a long project, but I learned a lot. And um, we met every Thursday for almost three years. And um, this is very well written. And I thank everybody that worked on it for that. You got a great team. Thank you, Mr. Bentley and Chief Hess. Item number 13 is discuss action to approve the purchase of stream mitigation credits from Dawsonville Bluffs LLC in the amount of $427,310 for the Mulberry Rock Park Phase 2 project. This is a SPLOST funded purchase in post two and mr michael justice to report i've got to take a minute to gather my thoughts after that one i'm sorry um, and thank you for placing me behind that one um earlier today you um read the uh, bid award for the phase two construction project at mulberry rock these next two items <clears throat> excuse me are a part of that project uh, in a nutshell, what's going to happen with phase two is a connection between the front of the park and the back of the park with a loop road. We are always taught to plan ahead. So in thinking of, of phase three, which may involve a, um, a large water feature in the center of that park, then we have to go the route that we're going today. Um, part of that uh, does involve going through some uh, or impacting some streams and some wetlands there. As part of that uh, in the Corps of Engineers and the nationwide permit, then we are required to buy mitigation credits to, to address those disturbed areas. This is where that is. And, and before I go any further, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Scott McNally with Croy Engineering for, for helping us get to where we are on that project. It's been a great help and a, and a valuable resource for us. And I thank him for coming and um, he can help me when I stumble a little bit today. So this first one, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that involves the, the stream mitigation credits. Um, the price is a lot lower. You have to go, you have to search and find mitigation banks. And they're not always where you want them to be, and the prices change from day to day, if not minute by minute. And we've had to lock in these prices as where they are now. With those, the stream mitigation credits, they're less expensive. They're only $95 per credit, but we only have to buy 4,498 of them. Um, so that's where the number, the 427,310 comes in. So it is a part of the approval process through the Corps of Engineers. It's mandated that we do it. Um, and this is the first one with the streams. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that, uh, that you might have on the stream side. Is it okay to ask a dumb question? I, if, if you want a dumb answer. <laughs> um, Scott will be here to help me if I can't get through it, but please, <clears throat> please do. So I didn't think you had to get mitigation for something if you weren't going to cover a stream up or something. It's, it, it's going to cost us more when we cover it up than it is to go through it with the road when we get there. Um, it's, it's just a, 
it's a core of engineer thing. I, I know that uh, you guys are very familiar with dealing with the core, with the building of the reservoir and that sort of thing. What they do is when you go through something like this, then they go back and they restore and they recreate in other areas. And this is the funding vehicle that they use to do it. Um, it would make sense that if you were going to add more of, of what you were going through, then you wouldn't have to do that. But that's not the way that it works, unfortunately. Any is other that, questions? Is that a pretty good answer, yeah, Scott? Okay. All right, well, let's move on to the next one. It's with um, Mr. Justice also. Uh, it's discuss action to approve the purchase of wetland credits from RES Aster LLC in the amount of $180,000 for Mulberry Rock Park Phase Two project. Uh, it's also SPLOS funded. Of course, the same location. Yes, sir, and the, and the same expl explanations for this one as well. Instead of streams, this one deals with wetlands. Um, we only have to buy two wetland credits, but where the other, the stream mitigation credit was low per credit, this one's higher. This one's two credits at $90,000 a piece. Uh, so that's where the number comes from that. Uh, same explanations as before uh, with the Corps and the nationwide permit being responsible for those costs. Question? Thank you, Michael. Appreciate sure. it. Thank you. And good to have you with us, and Croy. Thank you. Also good to have Alex with us. Hopefully, then when we get to that next one, since that lumber's good, I mean that number is going to be um, much bigger. That may be in my successor's uh, tenure, uh, so he'll. Uh, get to ask you for that that big number instead of myself yeah. thank you thank you Can I do 15 and 16 together okay I'm going to do items 15 and 16 to wrap up here discuss action to adopt resolution 22-09 providing for the levy and collection of an annual ad valorem tax to provide funds for the payment of the uh, principal of premium if any, an interest on the Paulding County School District general obligation refunding bond. This is a series 2025 bond in the original principal amount of $58,720. Thank you. Uh, principal amount of $58,720,000. Ms. Uh, Ms. Pollard and County Attorney Mr. Jason Phillips. Good morning, this is one of those things fortunate things you get to do because you're the tax levying authority so the school board has um, found an advanced refunding opportunity that they have approved at a meeting and they have sent it now to you to approve so that they can refinance the 2014 um, bond issue if you remember a few years ago I know the last two this current one and the one before they're e lost they're they're using their e loss to pay the debt so there actually hasn't been a millage rate but because the uh, bonds are backed with a tax levy um, it requires your approval so what the school board is requesting to do is to refinance the 2014 bonds which refinance the 2007 and 2008 um, this is not does not provide new money it's just completely an interest savings for um, an interest savings for their opportunity to save some money on the um, 2026 through 2023 um, financings so and in looking at back at 2014 their interest rates uh, for that time period was 3.75 to 5 and in 2020 well let me back up a little bit so we, this requires two this is the same money both resolutions are the same money but due to some tax law changes you can't advance refund a tax exempt bond so they're having to convert the tax exempt um, piece to a taxable piece to 2025 and then it becomes eligible for tax exempt so the savings that they're going to see were the original was 3.75 to 5 percent and then this at 2022 will convert to 2.28 percent and then the second resolution in 2025 will allow them to go back to a tax exempt and they will pay 1.79 percent so it's just continuously decreasing the rate that's a lot to say I'm not sure if I was clear 
So if I miss anything, let me know. And for the record, I'll read 16, discuss action to adopt resolution 22-10, providing for the levy and collection of annual ad valorem tax to provide funds for the payment of the principal of premium, uh, if any, and interest on the uh, Pauline County School District taxable general obligation refunding bond series 2022 and the original principal amount of 60 million 625,000. So I guess that's all just a duplication, just a different bond. It's just a different bond. So the 60 million 625 is the series 2022. And then in 2025, those will be re um, converted back to a tax exempt in the amount of $58,720,000. Do you have any estimate on uh, the, the amount saved by the county by refinancing? Um, I have the, the net interest cost, which is a percentage rate, but the original was three point, uh, let's see. The true interest cost was 3.02%, and then on the 2022 is 2.28%, and then again it's 1.79. I don't have the actual number of what that equates to, as to how many million dollars it equates. And how many years is it for? It's 2026 to 2023, I mean 2033. Is it paid off then? Sir? Is it paid off then? In 2033, it will pay off. It doesn't change the term or anything, uh, the, the length of time. Okay, now we're gonna have a test, commissioners. <laughs> That's the conclusion of regular business. Um, we don't have any citizens who signed up for non-agenda items. Any comments from commissioners in our open mic time? We're always open mic, are we? Well, <clears throat> as you see, I have a big gap between me and Commissioner Stover. Uh, and I just want to uh, thank Chuck Hart for his service. I've got a letter of resignation that's been uh, on our website and uh, other locations, but it's just about six lines. It says, it was with great personal struggles that I find it necessary to resign my post three seat on the Pauling County Commission. My resignation is a result of a series of personal family hardships. I'm thankful to God for his guidance in accepting this challenge and now once again for new direction. Please accept this rec recognition and know my prayers will be with those who remain and those who serve. Charles Hart. So uh, I'm very grateful. I don't know if they'll ever even see this uh, on the website or listen in, but I'm very grateful for the contributions that Chuck made. He's just very even keel, level minded. Um, and has helped in so many ways, hasn't he, Tara? Uh, with our personnel issues and law, law enforcement issues. So he's going to be greatly missed, and that's my comment for this morning. So um, we don't have executive session. Hoorah. The... Uh, Next thing on the agenda is to adjourn. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I have a motion to adjourn by Commissioner Caker. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Stover. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries 4-0.